so welcome everybody uh, to today's edition of our webinar on emerging topics in biomolecular magnetic resonance. Um, yeah, uh, we try to have exciting talks about magnetic resonance in biological systems every week and uh, upon the consent of the uh, speakers, we record them and upload the talks to the ISMRBS uh, YouTube channel. Um, uh, just to remind everybody, if you have any questions, uh, which we do hope you have, uh, please use the Q&A box uh, or raise uh, your hand to speak. Uh, we might not be able to answer all questions during the Q&A session, but we have the unofficial part, uh, which starts after uh, the second Q&A session, and, and there we can really uh, have a nice discussion and uh, any remaining questions are newly arising. We can also promote you to the panel uh, so you can speak for yourself uh, and have a nice discussion. Uh, I also remind you of the ICMRBS uh, Emerge, uh, Early Career Researcher uh, webinar, uh, which was actually uh, changed the format a little bit recently, and I'm sure it's, it's uh, now got even more exciting. So uh, please have a look at it too. Uh, without further ado, I give the word to uh, Lyndon Emsley, which will introduce our first speaker today. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to be able to introduce Lucio. So Lucio Freeman grew up in Argentina. Not everybody knows that. Um, and uh, his research today is focusing on topics ranging from MRI to NMR in solution and solids. So after his PhD in Argentina, uh, Lucio went to the Pines Lab in 1990, which is where we met. In 92, he, was, uh, he became a professor at the University of Illinois in Chicago. And in 2001, he moved to the Department of Chemical Physics at the Weizmann Institute in Rehovot which is where he is today. And he's currently head of the Department of Chemical and Biological Physics at the Weizmann Institute and chief scientist in chemistry and biology at the National High Magnetic Field Lab in Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, he, among you know, many achievements and recognitions, he was editor in chief of the Journal of Magnetic Resonance until I think the end of last year. Um, so stewarding our community from, from that extremely important position. His research, as many of you, I hope, already know, is characterized by out-of-the-box thinking um, that often it uses some form of cross-fertilization between ideas in correlation spectroscopy, both in solids and liquids, inspired by concepts that are related to you know, complex acquisition schemes from K-space in MR imaging and this kind of thing. This led in 95 to the kind of landmark multiple quantum magic angle spinning experiment for uh, quadrupolar NMR, which was really a revolution, both in terms of the concept and the application. Uh, and that's still the leading approach today in, in that area. 2002, he introduced uh, single scan um, multi-D NMR approaches in solution, again, which have become very well known. And more recently, these have been kind of working their way back into MRI um, to, to new encoding strategies for MRI images. So there's always that kind of to and from imaging uh, that we see. He's won a string of prizes, uh, the 2000 Gantilaukin Prize, the 2013 Russell Varian Prize, and more recently in 2019, he won the EAS Award for Outstanding Achievements in, in Magnetic Resonance. Lucio's work and his talks are never boring. And so I'm looking forward to hearing about putting annoying chemical exchanges to good use in solution state MR of sugars, proteins, and nucleic acids. Take it away, Lucio, 30 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Lyndon, for this uh, too good introduction. And thanks, uh, Marcus and company, for the invitation. I, I don't know if you know, but the week ends in Israel on Thursday afternoons, and I never, you know, you always see me among these 200 attendees because to me this is, uh, you know, the cherry on the on the cake when the week ends, just to relax and, and learn from from your series. So what I like to to tell you a little bit in the next uh, half an hour or so is some work that is uh, primarily the PhD work of of a. Uh, outstanding graduate student that recently left the group, Mikhailo Novakovic. Uh, and uh, 
is being continued by, by another very capable postdoc in the group, Ji Hyun Kim, on how to use uh, water exchanges and particularly things related to the cyst experiment in biomolecular NMR. And, and as I'm not a biomolecular NMR person, there is no way I could be telling you this story without the input of, of many collaborators, including uh, my colleague Rina Rosenzweig here at the Institute, a good friend Eric Skupche, and collaborations we've recently started with Darlene Friedberg and uh, Harald Schwalbe. So chemical exchange uh, with water. Of course, if, if you're trying to do an NMR spectrum of something very simple, like glucose, and it has labile protons, you know that those protons are not going to show up, and they're going because of the exchanges with the solvent, they are going to, to hurt you in terms of establishing nosy correlations and also polarization transfer to and from labile nuclei, like for instance, N15. On the other hand, if you are a person like Bob Balaban or Peter Van Zyl, you also know that these exchanges can actually help you magnify signals as they do in the CEST experiment. And they can really give you an enhancement which is several hundreds fold it's an enhancement that's given by, by the product of the exchange rate times the T1 of the receiving nuclei. And if the T1 of the receiving nuclei is uh, in the order of a few seconds and the exchange rate is a few hundreds of hertz, that, that you can see what kind of enhancements you can, you can get. And much of what, what I know about, about what I'm going to tell you about, I learned from this uh, seminal paper on how CEST works. And uh, this is a CES NMR spectrum that uh, we, we used for imaging a couple of years ago to image metabolites in the brain. And you can see that through the exchanges of the labile protons with water and the cross relaxation that, that non labile protons make with labile protons that then talk to the water, you can actually see on the water peak labile protons, the resonances of labile protons that with an intensity difference that the differential on the water peak that is tens of percent of what the water resonance strength is you can see semi-solid matrices and so on so you can actually see many things that uh, that uh, that uh, you can use and it's the same kind of of a spin scenario that that we are considering in our for instance protein nmr experiments when we got started on this if you're trying to establish uh, correlations, NOE or toxic correlations between the labile labile protons and the non labile side chain protons, you do it by somehow encoding the position of these amides or, or amines or, or, or other labile protons, but that gets all the time uh, scrambled by effects of exchange. And so although in principle, you should be able to get a, a fairly good exchange between uh, the labile protons and the non labile protons, the kinetics, this, this, uh, the losses that come from the migration of those protons into the water, uh, make these uh, in cross peaks much uh, smaller than what they should. And about that time, we were, we were also collaborating with, with uh, another uh, faculty here in the department, uh, Gershon Kulitsky, who introduced us to something that, that he called the anti zeno effect. And the anti zeno effect is related to one of some of these zeno paradoxes where by, by, by freezing, evolution, you can actually manipulate uh, the progression or the lack of progression of a system in Zeno's paradox in the quantum Zeno effect by, by, multi, by doing multiple projections, you freeze the evolution. In the anti-Zeno effect, by doing projective measurements, by stopping the evolution and restarting it again, you actually can uh, uh, speed up the uh, evolution that you're looking for. And you can see here, for instance, that if you do your, your NOE mixing and it starts with the fast buildup, but then the, the mixing with the exchanges with the solvent uh, scramble that. If you restart, if you restart the process and you restart the process with fresh and fresh polarization coming from the solvent, you can actually extend it much, much higher. And you can also see that from, from uh, this experimental data, this is uh, all the amides of ubiquitin. Of course, ubiquitin does not exchange that fast, but it exchanges sufficiently fast for the, for the effect to be seen. And this turns out to be not such a big effect in ubiquity. And you can see here uh, the amide the nosy uh, cross peaks also in the skyline projection of, a, of, a, of, of this uh, folded protein. But if you start having a, a more rapidly exchanging a, a label sites like the OHs in sucrose, or the aminos in, the, in an RNA, you can actually see 
that enhancements are, are quite significant. They can be in the order of three, four, five, six in terms of signal intensity. Uh, now, these kind of ideas of, of uh, repolarizing the system can also be used to encode heteronuclear evolution, either in a two-dimensional experiment or in only three-dimensional experiments. And uh, again, for the case of uh, ubiquitin, you, you can see that that, uh, that also translates, for instance, in proton-nitrogen correlations, where the nosy crossfits coming from the amides that are now also resolvent along the thin axis are enhanced just as they, they were in the homonuclear correlation experiment. And as I mentioned, the faster these, uh, these uh, exchanges happen, the larger the gain of, uh, of repeating the, the encoding process before actually making the, the final observation of the, of the non labile protons. You can see here a, a number of uh, folded and unfolded proteins that we receive from different collaborators. Where in, in the case of the folded proteins, the enhancements that you get over a conventional NOE are a little bit smaller. And these unfolded cases where the exchange rates are faster, the enhancements are actually large. And people usually ask, can, can you still get the structural information from these solvent enhanced prospects? And the, and, and the answer is yes, they behave monotonically more or less in the same way as they would do in a normal nosy experiment. Now, the, the, the enhancement itself will depend on the uh, correlation time of, 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 of the spin pairs and on the exchange rate, of course. But uh, given that you can measure this uh, by other means, you can actually, yes, end up translating the, the cross-peak intensities into, into distances. Now, if you think about the, the, the highest intensity that, that you can uh, achieve in this kind of, of, uh, of uh, cross-relaxation uh, cross-peaks, comes not, not so much for doing a T1 encoding where the, where the label proton uh, amplitude is modulated up and down, but by doing a CES-like experiment. And you can actually use uh, block equations to calculate what the enhancement of the cross peaks will be if you do a, a simple saturation of the label protons. And it turns out that if you compare that with the intensity of a regular nosy cross peak, it ends up being exactly the same as what you expect from a CES experiment. That means enhancement of the cross peaks will be given by the rate of exchange of the label proton with the solvent times the T1 of the receiving proton, the memory time. Uh, maybe scaled by the cross relaxation, but, but in general, this can be actually a pretty large number. And again, it's not that you are going to get a bigger cross peak than your ideal NOE cross peak, but you're going to be able to overcome the losses that come from, from the exchanges with the solvent the faster the exchange, the larger those losses are. And because they don't affect this kind of experiment, then the gains appear to be higher and higher. OK, and this is what I'm, what I'm showing here. In a way, you, you, you saturate the proton that is labile, and that gets repolarized. And it's either driven by, by J-coupling or by cross-relaxation. That information ends up uh, uh, printed into the non-labile protons. As you can see here, for some simulations done, whether with the looped inversion of the label proton or with the CW saturation of the label proton, that you can see that the faster the exchange, the larger the enhancement is, simply because the, the, the nosy cross peak becomes small, the conventional nosy cross peak becomes smaller and smaller. And you also see that there is something to be gained about increasing the saturation field if the uh, exchange rate is uh, larger. And that, that is because the exchange rate kind of broadens the peak and so it gets. Uh, in order to saturate it, you, you, you can use a higher uh, saturation field or a larger number of loops if you do inversion. And sometimes we do saturation, sometimes we do inversions. In, in, uh, discrete inversions are more convenient if these protons are bonded to N15 and you have to, to interject an N15 decoupling pulse here and there to get high resolution proton information. Now, uh, Again, we, we've gone back to doing nosy using CW encoding and a, a way to improve the sensitivity of CW uh, operations is by combining them with Hadamard transformations. In other words, in a, instead, if we have, if we know a priori what is our, our NMR spectrum, instead of irradiating peak by peak, we can do multiple combinations of the various peaks that we're targeting and then see how those get uh, uh, 
uh, trans transfer to the non to the non exchanging peaks to the non level peaks. Instead of doing the saturation one by one, then we do them in in uh, using this Hadamard combination where we, of ones and zeros where one means saturate and zero means non saturate. And then enhancements in sensitivity and the short during the acquisition time can actually be very impressive. You can see here that for a number of uh, OH groups of myelin ositol, as a matter of fact, the enhancements are, are quite similar to the ones that, that we get uh, using the PROSI experiment. Uh, you, you can see you can incorporate the toxi mixing or a nosy uh, mixing, and, and you can see that the cross peaks are enhanced more or less by the same amount. But of course, the acquisition time. Uh, given that that if you know which proteins you're trying to address beforehand, the acquisition times can be shortened very significantly. And the, that the Hadamard methods are, are a little bit trickier if, if you're trying to track, uh, tackle a protein that, that has a much denser uh, amide spectrum, even ubiquitin, but if you have a nice uh, high field machine, you can do that uh, frequency by frequency, and then the sensitivity enhancements are again comparable to the ones that we're getting with the l prosy but of course the acquisition times become much, much shorter. And they, we've been benefiting a lot from the gigahertz that for the last couple of years we've had at the Weizmann because all these level protons tend to have relatively broad lines and the, the, the spectra become much, much nicer as you go to higher field as I'm showing here with the tetramer that, that we started studying in collaboration with Aaron Friedberg and his group from the FDA. And so the, the higher the field, not only you get a nicer spectrum, you can accommodate faster exchange rates. And remember that the gains that, that this experiment gives are proportional to the exchange rates with the salt. And so this is a comparison. Sometimes we were asked, well, if you have a, a, a sparse spectrum, you shouldn't compare yourself with the regular to the acquisition. You should compare yourself with the sparse to the acquisition. Um, that is that is a good point. But even if you compare yourself with the sparse to the acquisition, the gains are, are very significant, both in the signal to noise. I'm showing here in red, the label by red, the assignments cross peaks between the OHs of the tetramer of the sialic acid tetramer and the and the aliphatic proteins that were simply not uh, visible in the conventional spectrum with or without the uh, uh, sparse sampling. And it turns out that <clears throat> those, uh, by the way, I, I'm not sure if I, if I, if I uh, pointed this out, but this experiment is done at five degrees. And uh, as a matter of fact, to get any kind of cross peaks with sugars, usually you have to go to super cool solutions under zero degrees. And so you're working quite far away from, from what would be more physiological conditions at minus 10 degrees or so. And so these uh, OH uh, <clears throat> derived restraints are actually, can actually be important because uh, if you incorporate them into, for instance, structures generated by, without them, you see that they actually are not compatible with the structures. And if you incorporate them into the structure calculations, you actually end up getting a different kind of form. And this is information that would not be there without with just the non-level uh, proton enemies. Now, as I was mentioning, uh, it, this is also works uh, really well for uh, uh, nucleic acids. And in particular, nucleic acids have this blessed region of the amino protons, which is very downfield. It's uh, fairly well separated from all the rest, very far from the water. Uh, and uh, very important because uh, there, there is one per base pair. And so, so many analyses of, of RNA and DNA as uh, Harald Schwalbe and, and his group has been, uh, have been teaching us over the last year of, that we've been collaborating, uh, they are actually quite important. And you see here the difference between a conventional nosy in, in a model 14 mer uh, RNA fragment between the amino protons here that are, are well known and well assigned and, and the amino and the aromatic uh, protons resonating here in the 5 to 9 ppm region. And you see again that you get in a much shorter time many more uh, cross peaks. And uh, I've learned that, that really to, 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 to appreciate this, you have to go and look at, at the one dimensional cross sections. And you can see here that there are a number of residues in particular, this U7 and U8, which are in this uh, 
loop region that exchange quite uh, readily with the solvent, but also in the neighboring ones to this loop region, where you actually just bring out peaks out of the noise. You see there is almost no information for U7 or U8 or G1. And so in an experiment that takes about one thirtieth of the normal acquisition time, you actually get the effective signal to noise enhancements that uh, are almost a factor of a hundred. And again, this is because the exchange rates for these uh, amino protons is in the order of tens of hertz, sometimes reaching close to a hundred hertz. I should also say that, that because you can gauge the exchange rates from the line widths, you can actually tailor uh, in these correlations the amplitude that you give to this Hadamard encoding, you, the, to the reference that you give in the Hadamard encoding, you can tailor it to make sure that you get the best saturation according to each chemical sheet. Uh, now, this is like in the L-Prosy case, what you are doing here is we're exciting or addressing one set of spins, say the amino protons, and then we're looking at the correlation with other set of spins, say the amino uh, protons or the aromatic protons. But it's also important in these cases to get uh, amino amino encodings. And so what we started doing is we went back to the standard uh, single frequency magnetization transfer experiment because it turns out that you can show that if you had a Martin code, the same protons that you're trying to correlate among themselves, you end up having artificial cross peaks. And, and I can tell you more about that later. And so basically what we do is just, we, we give up on the Hadamard multiplexing, which is actually a very nice sensitivity enhancement factor, but still the, the sensitivity, the strength of these cross peaks gets enhanced so much that it's still worth doing it uh, frequency by frequency. And again, I'm showing this for, for this uh, 14 mer. Uh, and, and it's interesting that, that, that the, for instance, here, this U7 and U8 I was mentioning before exchange so fast that you don't see their cross peaks. And it, by contrary, if you, if you do a saturation magnetization, selective magnetization transfer experiment, you can not only see their cross peaks within the monomer, but you can also see little uh, cross peaks with the dimer that the duplex that this uh, 40 mer is known to show. Uh, and again, you get, you get this in, in a much shorter acquisition time and you can crank up the temperature and as I said, it's not that the cross peaks get bigger, but, but you can see how, how the one dimensional uh, spectrum suffers from exchange as you change the temperature. And, in, and, the, and despite that, you, can, you don't suffer from that when you're looking at, the, at this uh, NOE cross peaks. Now, uh, thanks to, to Harold's invitation to join the COVID-19 uh, <clears throat> network, We've been uh, extending these experiments to, to various RNA fragments of the uh, uh, COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, RNA genome. And uh, you can see that again, this is a, a relatively small fragment, but you can still see that, that peaks that, that were not, cross peaks that were not visible in a regular uh, nosy experiment show up in this uh, selective MT experiment. And this is a larger fragment, and it's a fragment where many of the cross peaks uh, are still unassigned. I'm only showing some of the uh, assigned cross peaks. And, and again, you can see the presence of cross peaks in the selective irradiation experiment that are absent in the, in the conventional nosy acquisition. Again, this is best uh, visualized if you, if you just select one dimensional traces one by one. You see that the diagonals are enhanced and the cross peaks are enhanced. And even though we don't know exactly what they all are, we can see them out of the noise, which is a, a good starting point. Now, uh, in all these experiments, we are suffering from the fact that, that we don't have a, a heteronuclear dimension and the heteronuclear dimensions are quite important to help resolve this, this kind of spectrum. So we're trying to develop a, a method where we can actually selectively saturate a, a proton, but not just according to its proton chemical sheet, but along a joint proton nitrogen chemical sheet, because that would allow you to do this kind of Hadamard encodings or saturation transfer encodings, but in a two-dimensional plane, and then correlate these crosses, which correspond to their NOE cross peaks uh, within the aminos or, or with other with the amino sites. And the way we ended up uh, implementing that, we tried a, a number of avenues. We ended up implementing that in what we call a heteronuclear magnetization transfer experiment that is based on longitudinal selective cross polarization. So this is a, cro a selective cross polarization experiment that doesn't involve a spin lock. It starts from HZ 
and it turns out that it's a very selective way of, according to the proton and nitrogen offset, take plus Hz and make it into minus Hz. And the selectivity is pretty good and the signal to noise is pretty good. Here you can see the, the kind of proton spectrum or projection that we can get uh, from a priori knowing the proton and the nitrogen frequency, say from an HS2C experiment, but you can see that the sensitivity is very comparable to the one that the conventional HS2C or HM2C projection would give. And you can see here on, on a fairly crowded region that also the selectivity with which we can address each NH is quite good. And uh, we developed the theory of this selective longitudinal uh, cross polarization. And you can actually get a pretty nice inversion of Hz. This is how Hz evolves on and off resonance. And again, these are subtraction experiments. And you can see that, that we get a pretty nice inversion depending on, on uh, the offsets of the proton and the nitrogen. And again, th this is a, a projection of some of these uh, 3D head math experiments carried out on the, on the larger uh, uh, SLA fragment. I'm showing here in black the projection of the diagonal peaks uh, of the, in the nosy spectrum and in color are the cross peaks and, and comparing it with the 2D HSQC nosy, uh, 2D HMQC nosy results on the same fragment. And you can see that, that in general, we get large enhancements of the cross peaks, particularly in these uh, amino and aromatic uh, regions. And, and uh, I'm pretty sure that this, uh, this can actually be improved. These are still selective uh, uh, saturation experiments where we have now hadamardized these experiments and we see very nice signal enhancements. And uh, because these are relatively fast experiments, we, we are trying to see if we can introduce further resolution here with an additional indirect domain. And of course, the, the aim of the whole project is to use these kind of experiments in drug binding studies. Now in the last, two, three minutes, four minutes, I want to tell you that the same advantages can also be used for heteronuclear transfer experiments. Exchanges of labile protons with solvents are also enemies of uh, INEP or even CP, but much more INEP. You can see that if you do a CP experiment, and this, this is also been noted years ago by Skrinikov and uh, UN, uh, they also showed that, that the efficiency of the cross-polarization experiment in the heteronuclear transfer is much better than that of, of the net. And this is some of demonstrations of how as, as the exchange rate of in this particular is just the NH3 of alanine, as the exchange rate with the solvent gets faster, inept crumbles actually pretty rapidly and CP survives for longer. And it survives because there is also some kind of free polarization. You have your spin locked your water, you have spin locked your uh, labile protons and so although the labile protons are exchanging with proton the, the, with water the proton that comes from the water is also spin locked so it interrupts this it interrupts the cp process but the cp process can actually restart with that uh, repolarized solid so it's kind of like spin diffusion in in solid state cross polarization and uh, and uh, we see that that indeed uh, as 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 you increase the rate of exchange, both in experiments and in simulations, although you get a smearing of the cross polarization curve, which reminds of those that do solids, it's like a smearing of the ferrocene cross polarization curve that the uh, Ernst and Mueller got in 1974 in the solid state when you have spin diffusion and you go to a many body proton solid case. But although it gets smeared, the efficiency is still very high. It's, a, it's not that bad. The timing changes, but if your probe can withstand these cross polarization times, it's still pretty good. Now, the cross polarization back from the nitrogen to the proton, which you need for an indirect de detection experiment, doesn't work because the nitrogen goes to the proton and then the proton leaves and becomes a water. So you can detect this on the water, and that's something that, that we are looking into, and, uh, and, uh, and it's quite promising. But the question is whether we could use it for other kind of multidimensional correlation experiments. And the one that, that we started looking at are NCO experiments. And what we are using here is, uh, again, something similar to the l prosy the loop projective spectroscopy experiment, but involving the transfer of polarization from proton to nitrogen and then from nitrogen to carbon. And then in a way, the nitrogen acts as, as a conveyor of polarization 
and it, it passes its polarization to carbon. And if you have fast exchange, the transfer is different, but you can see that if you do this sufficient number of loops, the nitrogen ends up polarized by the protons and the carbon ends up polarized by the proton. And this is indeed what you can see in the experiment. So this brings me to the end of, of, of my slides. Uh, I, I started by mentioning that uh, exchanges with solvent are a nuisance. When you have label sites like amides or amides in proteins, hydroxyls and sugars of proteins, aminos and aminos and so on. But like so many other things, there are two sides of the coin. The same thing that hurts you can also come back and perhaps help overcome its own damages, particularly if you can address the, the resonances separately and if you work at high fields. El Pros is a realization of that idea using T1 encoding. And uh, I mentioned the selective magnetization transfer and the Hadamard encoded magnetization transfer are realizations of that based on CW kind of uh, manipulations that, that become, then they become very efficient and very fast. They still lack a heteronuclear dimension, which is necessary and it's needed to tackle these large systems. And we've started working on that with this HETMAT experiment and uh, uh, these uh, ideas of repolarizing reservoirs from the solvent and passing them onwards can also come to be uh, useful in uh, experiments that are meant to observe heteronuclei. And last but not least, I'm not talking about this, but it turns out that exchanges with solvent are not the sole way in which you can actually enjoy all this advantage. So last but not least, I wanted to acknowledge uh, the people in my group. This is my group uh, as of, uh, I think it was the uh, end of last uh, year, we made a, a, a foodless reunion, and uh, but we had liquids and uh, games and so on. So we still wearing masks. I think almost everyone now has been vaccinated. Uh, so, so that's good. And uh, I wanted to remark mainly the work of several years of Mikhail on this project and Chikun Kim that has uh, taken it over. Michael Yaroshevich that worked with Mikhail in the initial stages of this project and Maria Grazia Consiglio that has helped us with the spinach simulations I was showing at the end. Uh, these are the same people when we were maskless and we would uh, share barbecues and stuff and, uh, and hopefully we'll do that again. I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators, Harald Schwab, I mentioned, Eric Skupcher, Irina Rosens, by Gershon Kuritsky and Darion Friedberg, Tali Scherf who manages our NMR facility and we benefit a lot from uh, exchanges with the Yayantis from Darisan and Adonis Lukulescu, who are in uh, Kerala in India on many of these topics. Also, the, the FDA uh, co workers and the Gete University co workers and, and uh, Ilya Kuprov uh, with the spinach support, uh, the COVID and MR team, and a former postdoc in the group, Samuel Kuzin, who started working with us this and that, and as well as Ricardo Martino. And, Sabina Caballo and Debbie Fass. I'd like to thank my funding sources, but I, most of all, I'd like to thank the funding that the, the Institute has received over the last two years from the Clores Foundation and the Helmsley Foundation that have allowed us to get a gigahertz in MR and a 15 Tesla MRI and a seven Tesla human MRI and uh, lots of uh, toys that they uh, are waiting for good people to, to use them. So if you are out there in the 284 participants of this uh, talk and you're interested in uh, getting vaccinated and uh, put your hands on a gigahertz, uh, please write to me. And thanks again for the invitation. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thanks very much, Lucio. That was great. Um, we have a few questions on the, on the chat. So I guess my role is to read them out. So the first one is from Paul Chanda. Great talk. Just to get it right, in the Hadamard experiment, I assume that you actually have a series of 1D spectra and that the 2D that you show in the end is somehow reconstructed, right? Could you yeah. comment on how you do the 2D reconstruction? Yes, sir. Uh, that's a very good point. Let me see if I can uh, bring up a, a spectrum, like for instance, I think this spectrum. Mm -hmm. So this is a Hadamard reconstruction. It has, let's say, uh, 48 elements. Uh, and each one of these 48 addresses different combinations, say of 48 or fewer lines that we pick picked here. And then 
uh, we know we, what are the frequencies that we pick peak, and so we provide them into a addition subtraction, very simple algorithm, which called, that's what's called the Hadamard transformation. And then it puts this, the traces that it has separated at the indicated uh, frequencies here in the indirect domain. So this does not come from a Fourier transform, it comes from positioning the peaks, as, as that's how Hadamard, NMR, Hadamard encoded NMR works. Now you you see that these line widths are kind of you know quote unquote artificial, but they are not that artificial. They are point spread functions of their own, and they're given by the strength of the of the gamma b ones, the fields that we use for the encode. But, but am I correct in in thinking therefore that that is a kind of assembly of forty eight strips? It's an assembly of 48, not the 48 that you collected, it's 48 after they were yeah. exactly subjected to additions and subtractions and placed in their yeah. uh, 48 frequencies that, that, they, that they, you know what they are. In, in reality, in the sequence we deposited in the, in the Brooker library, you get the 1D spectrum, you pick peak on your peaks, and then you, the, the waveforms are generated automatically and the data are you know, come out as this 2D that I'm showing you. So you don't have, I mean, you, it's interesting to know what's happening, but it's not a must. And there's a comment from Jeffrey Bodenhausen, isn't hard CP from um, HN to N in liquids very sensitive to HH mismatch? You mean to Hardman hand mismatch? Yeah. Right. Uh, well, the, the gamma B ones that we use in this uh, experiment is uh, they are very weak. They are in the order of uh, fifty hertz. But when 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 you're talking about the hard experiment, it's still fifty hertz. Ah, no, I'm sorry. The hard, you mean the heteronuclear? No, I I, I was talking about this experiment. No, the heteronuclear, yeah, from the heteronuclear from protein experiment. To uh, yes, so this is something else that I'm not showing here, but it turns out that the looping, you know, if you have an inefficient CP, in a way exchange makes uh -huh. your, your CP inefficient and looping it brings back the efficiency. So it turns out that it's true that mismatch is like a sort of exchange, it makes it inefficient. But because the protons are getting repolarized all the time, it actually turns out that this gives a lot of robustness to the experiment. This is like multi-CP in, in a normal solids experiment. It's multi-CP aided by spin diffusion. So yeah. it, 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 it is broadened by the exchange. So yeah. it turns out that the, the optimal matching time will no longer be one over J, but you get almost the full intensity if you let the system cross polarize for long enough. Okay, and Alexei uh, Joshoff, who is you're opening new horizons for him. And could you summarize the exchange rate ranges where these techniques are efficient? What's the limiting factor? Well, it's like in CES, the, the, this, the sequence will be most efficient. I'm trying to bring a slide here. Uh, the, 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 the enhancement will be most efficient. The, I apologize. I think I have a proton spectrum here. here. The enhancement will be most efficient when uh, the exchange rate is the fastest, as long as it's in the slow exchange uh, regime. If it gets close to the intermediate exchange regime, you lose the spectral resolution. And then the, the experiments, you know, they're not so good, but they still work. If you, you can still address this peak, I mean, it may be 30, 40 Hertz wide or 50 Hertz wide, but you, you can still discern it. But sometimes if the exchange rates are very fast, the, the peak will just grow them into the noise. And then Fleming Hansen, great talk. Uh, for the HNCO transfer you showed towards the end, how high field strength do you need for the 1H DISP? Absolutely, very good point. Especially for proteins at one gigahertz. Absolutely, absolutely. Notice that the only example I've shown is on a 500 megahertz. So that's a very good point. You, you need to be able to spin log simultaneously the uh, labile protons and the water. And you have to do it well. So good point. That, that, that's still to be 
I mean, to do our amino and water spin locking with a single uh, broadband uh, tipsy pulse will be quite difficult. We've tried other ways of doing it, you know, not touching the water or touching it very strongly, but it's definitely, yeah, so the, the, the point of, uh, of spin locking both the target, the labile protons and the water, that's an important one. So then the last question is from Jeff Hock and it's uh, reconstruction relies on strict linearity, which would seem to preclude compressed sensing or max entropy for reconstruction of the Hadamard encoded spectra. So I think he's asking, can you combine the Hadamard encoded spectra with NUS or, yeah, or some right. other so compressed sensing methods? So definitely not in the, not that I know in the same dimension that your Hadamard encoded, but it's true that Hadamard requires strict linearity and that is precisely what gets broken if you do amino amino correlations. You know, if you're trying to do Hadamard encoding between the protons that both you encode and you detect, you, you can actually start seeing how the cross, the NOE effect will not be linear because if somebody cross relaxes against B and C and A, and A cross relaxes with C, you see that the, the spectrum of B will have something that has to do with A and C in it. And that's not what you're looking for. So we're 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 looking for ways of, of getting around that. But but you're right. I don't think you can actually, in terms of the, of doing NUS or something like that. I don't think you can add that as well into the Hadam. Lucio, if I could ask a question: sure. Is there any signature in the data from water molecules that are bound to? Whichever macromolecule you're looking at, but not actually exchanging hydrogens with the with the macromolecule. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps we've tried to we've tried to look at that by in proteins by uh, uh, doing these kind of experiments while suppressing all the M15H peaks. And we see strange things where we believe we only see the OHs and we believe we see strange peaks, but, uh, but we haven't looked at it carefully now. But that, that's a very good point. That's a very important point. Okay, I think that if there's no other questions then we can save the rest for later, right? If I understand correctly. And I'll yes, hand back to you. our great leader. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Lyndon, and uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Mike Williamson. Uh, so uh, Mike Williamson uh, did a PhD in structural studies on antibiotics uh, some time ago, and then he was a CERC NATO overseas research fellow at DPH in Zurich. Uh, after that, he became a team leader of BioNMR at Roche, so uh, some uh, time in industry. And from that, actually, he moved then to the University of Sheffield, uh, rising up through the ranks from senior lecturer up to nowadays, where he's the head of Department of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology. Uh, he has received a number of distinctions. I just want to point out, uh, because the webinar is also supported here by Euromar, he has been the secretary of Euromar uh, from 2004 uh, to 2009. So uh, without further ado, I hand uh, the stage to Mike. So thank you very much for inviting me to talk. Um, what I want to talk about is um, what to me is a really important question is how good are NMR structures? Um, and amazingly, we really don't have a good way to measure how good NMR structures are. And I hope to convince you that now we do. Um, NMR structures, they are about 10% of the PDB actually going down because crystal structures determinations are still going up fast. NMR structures are kind of tailing off a little bit, um, maybe because nobody can measure how good they are. Um, I would say the really big problem of the fact that you can't tell how good NMR structures are is that users of the PDB, ordinary people who just want to know what proteins look like, are kind of hesitant about looking at NMR structures because they have no way of knowing how good they are. There is a slight second problem in if you've got an ensemble of NMR structures, they don't know which one of that ensemble to use. Um, so it's a big problem. Um, crystallographers have a very good way of telling how good their structures are. 
um, basically because they have the input data, which is the diffraction intensities, and they can compare those directly to diffraction intensities back calculated from their structures. So they're directly comparing their input data to their structures. Um, and that comparison is the R factor. Uh, the R free is basically the same kind of thing, but um, selecting the data so you can look for overfitting of your data. Um, and then you've also got the resolution of the uh, X-ray data. So by combining those three things together, you can actually very, make a very good measure of how good your crystal structures are. Crystallographers also look at geometrical comparisons. So they will look, for example, at the Ramachandran outliers, how good the backbone phi and psi angles are, uh, at side chain outliers and so on, um, which do depend on the resolution. But by combining the geometrical measures with the, the crystallography measures, actually you get a very good measure of how good your protein is. NMR, we can't do that. We can do the geometrical stuff, of course, basically exactly the same things that the crystallographers do. But what we can't do um, is easily comparing our structures to our input data. Um, yeah, just to point out, of course, the geometrical measures tell you if your protein is a good looking protein, but it says nothing about whether it's accurate or not. If you really want to say, is your NMR structure accurate? Then you need to compare your structures to your input data. Um, and the obvious thing to do is to look at NOE violations. So do my structures match the NOEs that I used to calculate the structures in the first place? Um, and I think anyone who's ever calculated an NMR structure will realize that there is a lot of iteration and a lot of messing about with the restraints to get from the, from the spectra, the nosy spectrum, to the structure, um, which means that the final set of NOE restraints you use is, is just not original data. You can't compare them in the same way that crystallographers can. NOE violations are really not actually a very good comparison to see how accurate your structures are. You could look at the number of restraints. Yep, okay, that's not a bad measure, but it's a bit crude. Um, the thing that most people do, of course, is they look at the RMSD, the spread of the structures. This is very explicitly a measure of precision, not a me measure of accuracy. And there has been a lot of discussion as to whether precision and accuracy have any relationship to each other at all. So I think most of us would agree that RMSD is probably not a good way to measure accuracy. So it's a problem. How do you do it? Uh, we think we have the answer. Uh, and it's a program called ANSWER, um, which I will explain uh, how it works in a moment. We published this in Nature Commons the end of last year. Um, I give a link there. Um, there is also a website. The website is still being developed. Um, what you will find on the website if you go and look is that we have now analysed all of the NMR structures in the PDB. So you can go there to the website, type in your favorite NMR structure and see how accurate we think it is. Um, you can also download our software and give it a go yourself. Um, we are struggling a bit with that um, in that we, for example, it's not working very well on Macs at the moment, but we're getting there. Uh, just get in contact with us and we will do our best to help. What we are working on is a web server, so you don't need to download the software. You can just put it into the web server and that will come quite soon. OK, so what I want to talk about uh, now is how ANSWER works um, to show you a few of the things that we published at the end of last year, um, but very briefly because it's published and then to talk about some new stuff that we've been doing since. So what does it do? Uh, it doesn't use NOE restraints because, I, as I say, I don't think NOE restraints are in fact a good measure of accuracy. What we do is we use the backbone chemical shifts, these set of six, which are pretty reliable. They're determined all, almost automatically. If you deposit an NMR structure in PDB, you have to deposit the shifts anyway. So these are basically parameters that are readily available and very reliable. 
And David Wishart showed a long time ago that you can calculate what he called the random coil index. That is by looking at the shifts, you can say how random coil looking your protein is residue by residue. And that's what this is. So we calculate the RCI. Um, it's more or less exactly the same as the way he does it. And then the other thing that we do is we calculate from the structure, we calculate how rigid the structure is residue by residue. And this is based on a mathematical theory based on graph theory, uh, which is detailed there and you get a plot like this. And then what we do is we compare them. Um, so basically, this is the RCI measure down here. This is the rigidity of the structure. And we want to compare them. The, as you might imagine, the regions of very low flexibility down here are basically uh, regular secondary structure. The bumps here are loops. Um, there are several ways you can compare these two. And we actually do two different kinds of comparisons. We do a, an RMSD. Uh, just the root mean square difference between the blue line and the orange line. Um, and that is effectively, it's a measure of the overall flexibility of the structure. Does the experimental measure of the structure, the backbone shifts, match the calculated flexibility from the uh, structure? We also calculate a correlation, which is saying, are the peaks and troughs in the same place? And that's more or less saying, have you got the right secondary structure in the right places? Slightly more subtle than that, but basically that's what it's doing. Um, and just to point out, we actually do these not as raw numbers, but as a rank ordered percentile running from 0 to 100 for each of these two measures. Uh, and what we get is a two dimensional plot. So we're plotting the RMSD score on a scale of 0 to 100 horizontally, correlation score 0 to 100 vertically. Uh, what I'm actually showing here is four structures from the same calculation um, with the RCI data in blue, the rigidity data in orange. And you can see for these four structures, obviously they all have the same RCI output because that's from the experimental shifts, but they have very different calculated rigidity from the structure. And basically something up at the top right is a nice accurate structure something at the bottom left is a, a very bad structure. Um, this is a pretty quick calculation for one single structure. It just takes a few seconds for an ensemble. It takes a minute or so. Um, so it's not a, it's not a big calculation to do. In the paper that we published, we uh, described a number of analyses that we did. I just want to talk about two of them here. Um, one of the things we were trying to do was come up with agreed measures of what is a good structure and what is a bad structure. And there really aren't many because we have no good method until now of knowing which is good and which is bad. One thing that I would say everybody agrees is that if you take your structure and you refine it in explicit water, then it should get better. So we basically look to see if that's true. And this plot, is showing the change in answer score um, after you do a refinement in water. So for the change in answer score, this is looking separately at the correlation score and the RMSD score. The correlation score doesn't really change. That is, if you refine a structure in water, the locations of secondary structure really don't get any better. Um, but the overall rigidity gets much better. So yes, it is absolutely true. If you refine structures in water, they end up a lot better. It's worth noting. So what I've done here is superpose the structure before and after refinement in water uh, in the normal way that you do it by just doing an RMSD uh, comparison. And you can see that the regular secondary structure, the bits that strike your eye as the obvious bits, really haven't shifted much at all. So you know, the orange structure is a lot better, but it doesn't really look much better or different even from this comparison until you look at the loops. And when you look at the loops, you can see the loops really are quite different. Um, I will come back to that in a minute because that's actually very important. The other example I wanted to show you is that we compared uh, for a series of about 41 structures, 
that have both a crystal structure and an NMR structure, we look to say, how do they compare? Um, so I'm showing you first here the correlation score, which is again, the, it's basically the regular secondary structure. They're pretty similar. Um, means are very similar, distribution similar. That is, crystal structures and NMR structures get the secondary structure pretty good and about the same. The big difference comes when you look at the RMSD score. And on the RMSD score, here's the NMR structures, here's the crystal structures. The crystal structures are much better. That is specifically what that's saying is that if you look at the rigidity of crystal structures compared to the experimental NMR shifts, they're about right. NMR structures are much too floppy. Um, actually, when we did a more detailed comparison, crystal structures are actually too rigid. Not surprising because they're done at very low temperatures and in a crystal, um, but certainly NMR structures are much too floppy. Again, I will come back to that in a moment. So um, that's some of the things that we found in our paper from the end of last year. There's lots more in the paper, do go and have a look. What I want to do now is present just a few things that we've found since then. Um, and the first thing is just to look at all the NMR structures in the PDB and say, how has the accuracy of NMR structures changed with time? Um, so we're, we've looked at every year where the data are good enough for a statistically valid comparison. And what you see is that NMR structures improved in their accuracy up to about 2005 and haven't really changed since then, haven't really got any better. So the score I'm showing here, this is actually now the sum of the RMSD score and the correlation score. Um, so the complete Y axis here goes from zero to 200. So the reason they've plateaued is not because they can't get better, they can, they can go up to 200 and a few structures do. Um, but by and large, NMR structures haven't really improved. Um, why did they improve during this time? Well, certainly one reason could be because spectrometers were getting more powerful. Higher field spectrometer is more sensitive, you get more NOEs. Um, it is absolutely true, yes, so the, these are the mean uh, answer scores. They do improve. Structures have got better as the field strength has got better. Um, I think the main reason why structures got better here is methods were getting better. Um, and in particular, things like um, Cyana and Explore and AH were published about here, 2002, 2003. ARIA water refinement came out about here. Talos came out about here. By 2005, everyone was using more or less the same methods and they've used more or less the same methods since. So you could say it's not too surprising that things haven't improved but you would rather hope that they might and one reason they haven't is actually because we have had no good way of telling how good structures are until now and i'm hoping that this will encourage people to go away and look at better ways of getting structures um, we did have a look to say do different nmr groups produce structures of different quality and you might be relieved to hear that the, the data weren't good enough to really um, give us anything useful on that except what we could do is look at structural genomics consortia, which is shown in green. And the structural genomics consortia on the whole produce slightly better structures than everybody else did. Uh, you could argue that they have been accused of going for the low hanging fruit, the easy structures, which ought to be better anyway, possibly true. Uh, it's certainly not a major difference between what the structural genomics centers found and what everybody else found. Um, we've done a lot of comparisons of answer scores, that is our measure of the accuracy of NMR structures, to the kind of parameters that people use to look at NMR structures and say if they're any good. So just to kind of guide you through all these plots, I'm showing on the left here the answer scores going from 0 to 200. Um, and then what we've done is we've taken restraints such as here, the uh, NOE, number of NOE restraints per residue, binned them into different bins and looked at the average answer score, which is this mu equals number down here, um, and, and shown you the, the quartiles uh, for that. I'm not gonna go through all the data 
uh, because I don't have time, but just to point out a few obvious points. So if you look at the number of restraints per residue, um, it is pretty clear that the more restraints you have, the more accurate your structure is. Well, that's encouraging and good news and what you would expect. Um, interestingly, if you look at the NOE violations, which is this plot D here, um, you would normally expect that the more violations you have, the worse your structure would get, so that the accuracy should go down across this, and it doesn't really, it does at the very high violations, but normally it doesn't much. That is, NOE violations are really not a good measure at all of uh, how accurate the NMR structure is. And as I said earlier on, I'm not surprised by that, that's actually what I expected to find because they're such a, a derivative measure, they've been messed about so much. One thing that I was surprised about is this one, F, um, which is actually when we look at the, the backbone RMSD, the, the precision of NMR structures, actually it does correlate quite well with accuracy. That is, correlation, uh, there is a correlation between accuracy and precision, and it's not bad. The more precise structures are indeed more accurate. Um, why that is, is an interesting question, um, but it's, it's definitely clear that that's what's happening. Having said which, the most significant correlation is actually the correlation with uh, Ramachandran distribution. So the best single measure, apart from ANSA of course, the best single measure of NMR structure accuracy is actually how good the backbone dihedral angles look. Do they fit the Ramachandran distribution? Not too surprising perhaps because NMR structures are a joint refinement of uh, experimental data and uh, knowledge-based stuff about proteins. Um, slightly more surprising is the fact that the clash score, that is how much the atoms bump into each other, is actually really not correlated with accuracy at all, not really related. One final point I wanted to make before I stop. Um, what can we do with ANSWER now we've got this? And one really obvious thing that we could do is to guide structure calculations so that people calculating NMR structures can make better structures. Um, and also that they can know when they've finished, you know, how, is my structure now good enough that I can publish it or should I carry on trying to make it better? Um, and ANSWER can tell you that. Um, and we would be very happy to work with people on that. Um, ANSWER calculations are very quick to do, so you can certainly do this yourself. Um, and we're working on that. We hope to be publishing that reasonably soon. Um, just a few observations at the end, which I think are worth pointing out. Um, as I said earlier on, NMR structures are very clearly too floppy. Um, and in particular, when you look at loops in proteins, NMR structures are much floppier than what the RCI data tell us proteins are actually like. That is, NMR people have, have tended to say, well, loops are in solution, they're floppy, doesn't matter that we can't define them. Yes, it does matter. We should be able to define them much better. And in particular, we've tried this. So if you put in hydrogen bonds, for example, the hydrogen bonds that are there in crystal structures, you get structures which now match the IC RCI almost perfectly. That is, I'm convinced that loops have hydrogen bonds in them which persist and do define their structure. Uh, what we have to do now is work out how to get them. And actually, it does occur to me that the experiments that Lucio was talking about earlier uh, might well be really useful for doing that. Um, Second point uh, I sort of mentioned earlier that what we do when we display structures and compare structures is, is do this overlay of backbones uh, where you tend to emphasize the secondary structure because that's the way you draw it. Um, and there's been an assumption that if the backbones match then the structure is correct. Well, not really actually because having the backbones matching is only part of the answer uh, the side chains really do matter and the side chains really should be defined in many cases. Uh, and what I think NMR is doing not nearly a good enough job 
of working out where the side chains are. And again, we could get better. Um, and thirdly, as I say, NMR structures haven't improved since 2005 uh, because we haven't had a good measure of telling how good they are. And I think uh, it's now up to us to make them better um, and basically make NMR structures more kind of respected as measures of uh, quality. Um, I shall stop there and invite questions. Just want to thank the people who did the work. Nick, uh, my postdoc, um, who's done all the coding, uh, come up with most of the ideas. Uh, great work, Nick. Fantastic stuff. Adnan, who's a mathematician, and it was his work who kind of alerted me to this idea in the first place that you could do this comparison. Um, and the BBSRC who gave us the money to do it. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Um, so there are a number of uh, questions already in the Q&A. Uh, I would pick one, uh, but rephrase it uh, for my own uh, benefit. <laughs> so um, uh, uh, I mean, uh, also uh, at around 2000 or whatever, RDCs have been introduced, right? And uh, and this is particularly important, of course, for the relative orientation of secondary structure elements such as helices. So did you uh, sort of have a look at this if uh, with and without RDCs, this uh, is reflected in your parameter? That's a really great question. No, we haven't. And it's very near the top of the list of things that I want to do. Yes. It's an obvious question as to whether RDCs would improve the loops and I would hope that they would. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, then I'll start from the top. Uh, Fabio Almeida asks, uh, uh, says, great talk. How do you see the NMR structures calculated with these or set up plus NOEs and other NMR derived loose grains? Sorry, could you just say that one again? Um, how do you see the NMR structures calculated with CS Rosetta uh -huh. plus NOE? So, so I guess the question is, um, is the problem, let's say the force field or the non-existent force field, which is used in uh, Cyana and Aria and so on, and, the CS Rosetta, where you have the empirical force fields, the structures uh, will immediately get better. Yeah, okay. uh, and that, that's a really important point because yes, obviously the structures that are calculated with Rosetta will be much better looking proteins. Um, they won't necessarily be any more accurate, uh, which makes it all the harder to tell using the kind of geometrical measures that I talked about at the beginning. Um, what we've done to address that actually is to generate a range of quality of structures using decoys, which has the same, same idea as Rosetta, that you're calculating structures that look like great proteins. The good, they have good packing, they have good range under distributions, they're just wrong, or span a range from wrong to correct. Um, and it's very good at discriminating those. Yeah, so I, I really think, yes, given a Rosetta structure, we could tell you whether it's correct or not. Should say, we've actually looked at the, the recent predictions of DeepMind and uh, it matches those too. So yeah, it works. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Ho, uh, first of all, he, he encourages you to maybe supply the answer software to the NMR box platform, uh, if he was willing to do so. Uh, but then he also has a question. Uh, so uh, Jeff says that they've been finding evidence that hydrogen bonds to aromatic pi pi clouds are more common uh, than thought. RCI, CS Rosetta, and so on uh, leverage backbone shifts, but not side chains. So uh, he's wondering if additive empirical force fields used for refinement, or these edits, I mean, they don't capture these effects, so one might have to use polarizable force field or so. Could that be the fixing the problem of NMR structures being too floppy? It's a great question. Um, I mean, it's an interesting question because what we're using an answer is backbone shifts. Um, so the shifts we're using do not directly tell us about side chain positions, but it's absolutely clear that the rigidity of the protein is determined by hydrogen bond side chains just as much as it is backbone hydrogen bonds. So although we're not explicitly using it as a measure, we, we can definitely tell whether the side chains are correctly positioned or not. Um, not sure if that quite provides the answer. I mean, I think there are all sorts of constraints we could look at, at including. And now that we have what I hope is a good way of doing it, 
yeah, let's let's throw them in and have a look. Okay, thank you. Uh, then Maximilian Zinke uh, uh, asks, uh, it seems to depend a lot on the flexibility derived uh, from the program you mentioned. Is there any sort of cross validation? I guess for this uh, rigidity calculation uh, from the graph theory. Um, okay, depends what you mean by cross validation. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know. Maybe it means so. Uh, I mean, if you choose a different, let's say, graph theory or a different approach to uh, to estimate the rigidity, uh, how would that affect then the uh, analysis? Um, we've done all the comparisons we can think of. So, for example, that, I mean, that was the reason why we looked at crystal structures. You can certainly see that, um, on the whole, there is quite a good comparison that when the NMR structure is similar to the crystal structure, then it comes out better scoring an answer. Um, that's not universally true because, as I said, crystal structures are actually too rigid. So when you get to very good structures, it doesn't work. And I think that's a, a very exciting area that again, for the first time, we can actually say whether there is a genuine difference between the NMR structure and the crystal structure, which I would say up till now, we've hardly been able to do. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm open to the idea of doing cross-validation. I just can't think quite how to do it. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so, so maybe we take one more question, the official part, and then move uh, to the inofficial section, then we can uh, answer all the other questions and also promote uh, uh, the audience or the attendees to the panel, and then they can ask the question themselves. So the last question then would be from Geoffrey Bodenhausen. Is the rigidity of loops in X-ray structures uh, not a, a fallacious effect of crystal packing? <laughs> Um, to some extent, yes, of course it is. Um, there are well-documented evidences of loops that are forced in that position by crystal packing, yes. Um, what I was trying to point out was that what RCI gives you, I, I, I hope, and that's the assumption I've been using, is, is a genuine experimental measure of how mobile loops are. Um, and actually, when we've compared crystal structures to RCI, they match pretty well. They are slightly too rigid, but only just, whereas loops in NMR structures are much too floppy. So by and large, I would say actually crystal structures are pretty good. Yes, they, yeah, of course there are, there are crystallization artifacts, but I don't think they're actually very severe most of the time. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, with that, I would like to close today's uh, official session.